the most famous photograph in the history of aviation, the Wright Brothers' first flight, December 17, 1903, near Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. How do you do? I am Paul Garber. It is my privilege to be the historian emeritus for the National Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And I'm pleased to bring you another of the series on the history of flight, part two of the Wright Brothers. I want to emphasize the significance of this wonderful photograph. This occasion that you are seeing was the first time in the history of the world that a machine heavier than air, not a balloon, not an airship, heavier than air, carrying a man, had risen from the ground under its own power, had flown forward under control. Without reduction of speed, and had landed without wreckage at a point equally as high as that from which it had started. Now that very excellent definition of what constitutes true flight is the best setting forth of the principles that constitute practical aviation. There are many other persons for whom the first flight was claimed. Oh, Whitehead in Connecticut, Adair in France, Maxim in England, Santos Dumont in Brazil, Jethro in Germany, each one deserving his place. But when you take their claims for the first flight and sift those through that definition, none can equal the qualifications that the Wright brothers did possess, and they remain preeminent as the first to fly. That definition is contained in the first article prepared by Orville and Wilbur Wright, it appeared in the Century Magazine for September 1908 and is an excellent article for all of you to read. You will enjoy it. You will benefit from it, as I did. There were four flights made that day of December 17, 1903. The first, with Orville at the controls, was for 12 seconds, a distance of about 120 feet, 10 feet per second. The second by Wilbur, about 175 feet. The third by Orville, the brothers alternating, was a similar distance. But the fourth by Wilbur was 852 feet in 59 seconds. He really got up and flew that thing. But in the landing, which was abrupt, well, nobody had ever flown an airplane before. There were no books on this, no training lessons. They had to teach themselves. And each flight ended as a wingtip would touch some little bit of ground. But in that landing by Wilbur, there was some damage and they took the aircraft back to the hangar and there had taken off the front elevator member and were going to repair it. Now the wind was very strong that day, 27 miles an hour, and as they were talking about the flight and working on this, this repair, the wind got under those wings and all of a sudden the aircraft was raised up and then over and then over and over and over just like a box kite with a broken string and it was impossible to repair it at that time, so the brothers decided to pack up and go on home in time for Christmas. But first, they wanted to send a telegram to their father. In fact, they'd planned to fill the gasoline tank all the way and fly over to the telegraph station. But they walked over, and there they did send this telegram. Success, four flights Thursday, Thursday morning, all against a 21-mile wind, actually 27. Started from the level with engine power alone, average speed through the air 31 miles, longest 57 seconds, really 59, informed the press, home Christmas, signed by Orville Wright. Well, the telegrapher had mixed up a couple of figures there, but when the father received this, he gave it to his daughter and said, hurry on down to the newspaper and tell them this wonderful news. Well, the Dayton Journal had but recently heard about some flights made by a Zeppelin airship from 
Ofridish coffin to Stuttgart or some 60 miles or so. And he thought, well, what does a 57 second flight got to do with anything of importance? And so the Dayton Journal had nothing at all. In fact, well, the Virginian Pilot uh, newspaper did have a very flamboyant article, quite incorrect. But that was copied here and there. It came out of the New York Herald about a month later. And a very flamboyant description of things that just could not be, said the flight had been for three miles. And this picture shows a, a propeller underneath to push it up. But even so, it was publicity. And yet, then it subsided. And the world forgot all about Wilbur and Orville Wright. Well, they no longer had the need, you see, for the high hills and the strong winds and the soft sand there at Kitty Hawk. And so, near their home in Dayton, Ohio, they obtained the use of a field about seven miles away called Huffman's Prairie. Now, Wilbur made this sketch several years later to show some friends where it was. And you see that large oval there with a hanger up there at the top. And there was a streetcar line that ran on one side of the field and a public road on the other. Persons who say the Wright brothers practiced in private just didn't realize the facts. But there at Huffman's Prairie, the Wright brothers first set up a rig similar to that which they had had at Kitty Hawk. That is the long rail for takeoff. And yet, in the summertime, you see the air doesn't have the buoyancy, doesn't have the, the, the depth, the body, as it does in the winter. So summer air didn't have the same strength. And thus, the Wright brothers decided they needed more push to get off the ground. So they contrived a catapult. Now, over here at the right, you see that tower. That tower had a weight that was pulled up to the top. I can show that better in a drawing. And uh, thank you. Here, at the top of the tower was that heavy weight. And then a line on that weight went up to the top over a pulley, down that front leg, way over here to your left, over the end of the track where there was another pulley. And then the line went to the front of the airplane. Then you see, when the weight came down, the airplane was pulled forward and thus into the air. Now that was first tried on September the 4th of 1904. There's Wilbur up there attaching the fittings for the pulley tackle, and uh, there's the heavy weight there on the ground. Now, actually, this picture was taken a few years later, but it shows what I'm trying to illustrate. The use of this catapult for takeoff. We all know today you've got to have more gun to get off the ground than you do to stay up there. So in 1904, they made 105 flights, the longest over five minutes. That was on September 20, when for the first time they flew out and back. Now these others I spoke of, these other experimenters over there in Europe, they'd made little bounces off the ground, but in a straight line. But the Wright brothers there on September 20 flew out and back in big circles and in figure eights gaining good control of this aircraft. The next year, 1905, they flew for more than half an hour, a flight of 24.2 miles in 38.5 minutes. This was such an excellent accomplishment that the Wright brothers then wrote to the War Department and said, well, we've perfected an airplane that we'd like to demonstrate to you. We think it has military possibilities. We'd be very pleased to show it to you. The, right, the War Department paid no attention, just sent them a form letter saying that, well, it wasn't at all helpful, just saying that demonstrations had to be given. The Wright brothers had already asked for that. But here, they did receive their patent in 1906. They'd applied for it in 1903. And this patent is another thing I want to emphasize to you. This was not merely a patent for lift. Aircraft had been lifting since the first kite 3,000 years ago. Things had been steering since the Chinese put a rudder on a boat maybe another 3,000 before that. But the patent of the Wright brothers was for the combination of balance, lateral balance, and the control of yaw. Yaw is that tendency of an aircraft to sort of slew around in flight. But by the addition of that rear vertical surface and the manipulation in connection with lateral balance, the Wright brothers did develop the basic elements of true flight. It's interesting to see what the rest of the world is trying to do during this period. There was Vuya of Bulgaria, who had made this very interesting aircraft. This is preserved today in the French Musée de l'Air at Chalimoudon in France. You should go over there and see it. It has an Antoinette engine, 
and it, oh, it barely skipped along the ground. Maybe the tracks got a bit late. Here is Ellahammer in Denmark. And this, oh, rose about a foot and flew about a hundred feet, but it was tethered to a post so that some of those, some of that lift could have been centrifugal. Then there was Alberta Santos Dumont of Brazil. He was in France, and he, as you see, rose, oh, a bit, and went about 80-some feet, and then later on went about 200 feet. These were the first flights officially witnessed by representatives of the Fédération Aéronautique Internationale in Paris. And thus, Santos Dumont is often credited as the first to fly. But it was not until the end of 1907, as you see here, that anyone else flew an airplane as much as a minute. And yet the Wright brothers had flown more than half an hour back there in 1905. Now the efforts with the War Department continued to be frustrating. The Wright brothers had hoped that our own country would be interested, but there was very little response. In the meanwhile, other countries were becoming interested. Russia and France and England and Germany. And so in 1907, Wilbur went to France and tried to make some arrangements for demonstrations. Then Orville followed and tried to help with these. Then Orville was asked by Wilbur to prepare one of their airplanes for demonstrations abroad. But it just lay in customs while all of these negotiations were going forward. But now in the meanwhile, there was a plan to have a meeting of all the navies of the world down at Hampton Roads. And the Wright brothers thought, well, Nobody believes we can fly. All of these efforts to get together with these governments are so frustrating and disappointing. Let's go back to Kitty Hawk, they said. Let's put floats on our aircraft and see if we can't fly off Albemarle Sound. And then we'll fly over those, those vessels. And certainly the fleets of the world will be impressively convinced that an airplane does exist and that we can fly it. Well, they never did complete this experiment. Here you see them on the Miami River near Dayton. They had, um, incidentally, I want to emphasize that they used hydrofoils on those floats. Now, you think hydrofoils are new? Well, they were invented in 1905 by Forlanini in Italy. But the Wright brothers here, just two or three years later, had learned about them and put them on these floats. They got some lift. But they gave up these experiments before they were completed because France did show some positive interest. But the Wright brothers had, hadn't flown since 1905. So they went back to Kitty Hawk. And there, this photograph, quite retouched, was taken by Jimmy Hare of Collier's Magazine. And the article by Byron Newton described how these Wright brothers actually did fly. Those reporters lay there sort of in ambush. The Wright brothers knew they were there, but the reporters didn't know the Wright brothers did. And they took this picture and they made this drawing which shows that for the first time, they, they were sitting up. And there, also for the first time, is a passenger carried in an airplane. The passenger is Charlie Furness, one of the Wright brothers' mechanics. And these flights were very helpful in regaining their skill, teaching a new method of control. You recall that previously they had lain prone. And so with this new experience, this new practice, Wilbur then went to France. He got that airplane out of customs, which Orville had sent over the previous year. And he had this shed constructed for him. Mr. Hart O'Berg was his very good friend over there. And this shed was much like the one he'd had at Kitty Hawk, the one out of Huffman's Prairie. And Wilbur lived in that shed. He didn't go at home to some hotel at night. He lived there. He had his galley over there in the corner. He had a bunk, some kind of a canvas bed. And he lived and worked and lived until he got the job finished. But in the meanwhile, these French thought that he was just bluffing. They thought, well, look at all the wonderful flights that our persons have made. And yet uh, this Wilbur Wright is just a bluffer. So this was called Le Bluffeur. And there were other criticisms that were not at all complimentary. But Wilbur kept on working. And then came the day when he brought the aircraft completed, repaired, ready to fly, I said repaired because there had been some damage to it while it was in customs. Uh, Orville later thought somebody had gotten into that box and was responsible for the damage that Wilbur complained about in the packing. But here is the aircraft repaired, brought out, the rear rudder put on, the front elevator put on, all ready for these demonstrations. Now these were to take place at Le Mans. 
The Mars about um, 30 miles, I was told, outside of Paris. Later, they went down to Pau, which was a warmer section of that country. But here's Wilbur. He's got those beams, those tuba fours. Maybe that's a tuba six that he's going to lay in the line for that launching track. And then he's going to climb up there in the tower, make, make that all rigged up, get that ready for the weight. Here he is fixing up the lines by which the aircraft is to be catapulted into the air. And then the aircraft was brought out, placed upon the track. There it is being moved out. Now we have a wonderful motion picture here, the first ever made of an airplane in flight. And I'm so pleased that through the help of National Archives and this wonderful crew here in the Navy, the two gyms, that we can show it to you. There's Wilbur putting a wheel under that wing, a wheel under the other wing, and thus it is just rolled over the ground. Those wheels were just for temporary use. Now here's a working party. In fact, persons later considered it a great honor to help pull that weight up. There's a passenger seated because you see Wilbur was going to take passengers over there also and teach persons to fly, starting the engine by getting those propellers on compression, and then down she goes, and there goes the weight, and there goes the aircraft, and into the air. There were hundreds, thousands of persons came to see these flights. These were astounding. They were the greatest news of the day, just as later on we had the news of the trip up there to the moon. And... These flights, oh, about 35 miles an hour. Well, a short film, but very impressive, and I'm so glad we had it. Now, the first of Wilbur's passengers was Mr. Zenz, a noted balloonist of that time. Interesting to look at that control. Wilbur's left hand controls the front elevator. His right hand controls the rudder when he pulls it back and forth, and then controls the wing warping as he moves the lever from side to side. No safety belts, just sort of sit there and hope you're kept in by the wind pressure, then off into the air. Now, Mrs. Hart Oberg is said to be the first woman ever to fly in an airplane. She was the wife of the man who had made the arrangements for Wilbur over there in France. I want to call the lady's attention to that very modest bit there. This line has been tied around her dress at the ankles. It was just terrible back in 1908 to show an ankle. Later on, in, when I became a little older, why... Ankles were no longer a mystery. But uh, <laughs> in those days, women were a bit more modest. And again, you see the method of control with Wilbur's hands. She made a flight that she enjoyed a great deal. And as Wilbur continued to fly, this news came to the ears of royalty. Now, you always hear about a royal command requiring a person to go to see that royal person. But here's the king of Spain coming there to France to see Wilbur. The king of Spain there at the right with the hat on, very interested in all that he was witnessing. Wilbur was showing him how the engine operated, how the controls were working. And the king wanted to take a flight. In fact, he got as far as that front seat. But about that time, the queen said no. So poor Alphonse never got his flight. And yet he was so impressed, as was the king, King Edward of England, who also saw the Wright brothers fly and the king of Italy, as you'll learn when I give the next part of this story. So, in the meanwhile, now, James Gordon Bennett, the editor of the New York Herald, had originated a number of prizes for competitions and transportation. The James Gordon Bennett Balloon Prize was won by Frank Lom, who you see there at the left. He was Lieutenant Frank Lom, United States Army, Cavalry. His companion was Major Hersey. And they did win that first James Gordon Bennett race. But in the meanwhile, Frank Lom and his father were learning about the, about the uh, work of the Wright brothers. And it was so impressive to them. They were so proud of these Americans. And so they interceded with Theodore Roosevelt and urged that the Wright brothers be, be permitted to demonstrate their airplane in America, even though the War Department had not shown the interest. So Theodore Roosevelt directed his secretary of war to get on the beam. Specifications were written, and bids were let out. In fact, 41 persons responded. They thought the rights would be the only one, but 41 persons responded at various prices, one one of the million dollars. Well, the Wright brothers bid $25,000, and the contract was awarded to them. So then, Orville was to give those demonstrations at... Fort Meyer, while Wilbur was giving his demonstrations in France. 
And here is one of those specifications being fulfilled, that the airplane had to be sufficiently portable to be carried from one place to another on an ordinary army wagon. There's Orville on the running board of that car. The craft is coming up the hill there at Fort Myer, and then was to go across the drill field, where at that time, as you'll see, the army was experimenting with balloons. In fact, the army had used balloons as far back as the Civil War. And we're going to tell that in another one of these parts. Also, the army was interested in an airship. And this airship had been made by Thomas Baldwin. And the power was provided by Glenn Curtis, Glenn Curtis of Hammondsport. I'll be mentioning him a little further on. And this airship was quite successful. The flights by it were in July. Well, now here we are, September, early part of September in 1908. The airplane being unloaded into the hangar there, where it was assembled. Orville supervising the mechanics, Charlie Furness and Charlie Taylor, getting a hand from the men of the signal corps there. And then it was brought across the field, again using those temporary wheels, as you saw, being taken over to the catapult, the launching tower. Again, there were thousands of persons there to see these flights. Uh-oh, look out, girls, get out of the way. There's that miniskirt of 1908 demonstrated by these two ladies who were in the way at the moment. Then over to the launching rail, and you can see at the left the tower, and the launching track is underneath, and then the aircraft was being adjusted, ready for takeoff. There's the takeoff. The first one was on September the 3rd. And then, you see, part of these specifications required that a passenger must be carried and also that the craft be able to fly for an hour. Well, Lieutenant Lom, now there, there at Fort Myer, and shown here with Glenn Curtis, who made the engine for that airship that you saw, Frank Lom was to be the first military passenger. And on September 9, Orville first went up for a flight of 57 minutes and 25 seconds. Then on his next flight, he flew for an hour, 2 minutes and 15 seconds, the first time in the world that an airplane had flown for more than an hour at Fort Myer. In fact, sometime when you go to Fort Myer, Virginia, you'll see at the reviewing stand a plaque there, a bronze plaque that uh, my wife and I provided through the Early Birds organization. That's a bunch of old-time flyers. And on there we've listed all these famous firsts of, avi firsts of aviation at Fort Myer. Well then, on September 9, Lom became the first passenger, military passenger to fly, and the duration was 6 minutes and 24 seconds. Six minutes, 24 seconds, a world record with a passenger. Then, on the 12th of September, the passenger was to be Major Squire. Major Squire, standing there with his back to us. Now, notice that flag on the front strut there, the elevator. That had been given to Oroville by Mrs. Winfield Scott Klein. She became wife of the photographer and uh, later they gave that flag to the National Air and Space Museum. Not the first flag to be flown, because back in 1904, when Roosevelt was elected, the Wright brothers had flown a flag on their airplane at Huffman's Prairie. But now, there's Major Squire. He's going to be the next passenger, and on the date of September 12th, he did have a flight for nine minutes and six seconds. That was another world record. Meanwhile, of course, Wilbur was making those flights with passengers in France. Now, on the 17th of September, the passenger was to be Thomas Ethelin Selfridge, the gentleman in the foreground, and he is with Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone. Now, Dr. Bell had been interested in aviation for many years. Up at his summer home in Bedeck, Nova Scotia, he had developed a series of kites, and then, having brought together a group of men who consist here of uh, Casey Baldwin. Now, he's no relation to the airship Baldwin. He's the left. Then, Lieutenant Selfridge. In the center is Glenn Curtis, who had been brought in to make the engines. Curtis was a very capable maker of excellent motorcycles. And these motorcycles had been seen by Baldwin, and an engine had been seen by Bell, and thus, Curtis was under contract with Baldwin to make engines for the airships and with Bell, an associate, to make the engines for their airplanes. In fact, Bell first tried the Curtis engine on a large kite 
but the kite didn't get off. So then, at the right there was McCurdy, who was carrying a crutch because he tried out one of Curtis's motorcycles. Well now, Selfridge had the honor of designing the first airplane. They called it the Red Wing because there was quite a lot of red silk left over from some of Dr. Bell's kites. And this was tried first in March. It went up rather steeply and came down rather hard. They had left out one very important element, and that was lateral control. They had lift. They had an elevator there for raising it. You see that there in the front. Also had an elevating surface at the rear. And then they had that vertical surface for steering at the rear. So the aircraft got off, but it did not have control. That was a very essential element. So Selfridge wrote to the Wright brothers and asked for information about lateral control. The Wright brothers wrote a very courteous reply and suggested that he study their patent. Now the next aircraft was designed by Casey Baldwin. They called this the White Wing. They had run out of red cloth, probably. And in this one, Selfridge did fly. That was, that was in uh, May, May the 19th of 1908. Thus, you see, the first time in the history of the world that a military officer had piloted an airplane, Thomas Ethelin Selfridge. Well, now, this fine young man was to have this marvelous experience of flying with one of the two greatest pilots of that day, Orville and Wilbur Wright. This picture was taken by Carl Claudy, a Masonic friend of mine, and Carl told me, as he gave it to me, he said, when I snapped this picture, Selfridge called to me, look out, Carl, we're just about to take off. Well, they did. The weight dropped, the rope pulled, they went forward and into the air. Well, they'd made four circuits of the field and were just about at this point over that hangar there in the corner when, as Orville later said, he heard a clickety clacketing sound. And he glanced back hurriedly. He saw that something had broken. Well, a piece of propeller had broken. Later, it was picked up, found there on the ground. And you see from that piece of propeller how it had struck a wire. And uh, we can have just a little bit of the top of it there. You'll see where the, the uh, wire had gouged into it. Well, as, as the propeller broke, the propeller broke the wire, pulled the wire loose from that connection. And, of course, this happened so fast, it's much faster than I can describe it. But it pulled that wire loose. Now, that wire led over to the vertical rudder at the back. And without the tension of that wire, that rudder lay over and became a horizontal surface and nosed the craft over into a crash. September 17, 1908. Now, in that crash, Orville was badly injured. And, oh, he suffered injuries to his hip and uh, ribs. In fact, for the rest of his life, he suffered from that. He recovered in about seven weeks. But Selfridge had sustained a concussion. He never regained consciousness, and he died in two hours. Selfridge thus became the first sacrifice to powered aviation. Such a, oh, such a sad paradox that the first military officer to fly should be the first military officer to give his life for aviation. Had he lived, no doubt, the whole science of flight would have benefited. Very fine young man. He's buried now over in Arlington, Virginia, in the National Cemetery there. I often go over there to visit his grave. In fact, the early birds think of that place as sort of a shrine of aviation. And we can regret his death, and yet we are so grateful for his life because he, certainly while he lived, did advance aviation a great deal. Aviation has had its losses and its great gains, and we of the public are those who benefit from the progress that has been made. Thanks to Orville and Wilbur Wright, we do have the beginnings of flight and great advancements in progress as our story continues. <laughs>